It's happening. A supporter of domestic terrorists is now on the Homeland Security Committee. Marjorie Taylor Greene, the radical Republican congresswoman, a joke of a woman making the United States a global laughingstock who defended and supported the domestic terrorists who stormed the Capitol on January 6th of 2021, who pushed 9-11 conspiracy theories, who talked about Jewish space lasers. She will sit on the Homeland Security Committee. The woman that said they would have been armed and would have won if she led the January 6th coup is now on the Homeland Security Committee. The Homeland Security Committee should be investigating people like Marjorie Taylor Greene. But it is Marjorie Taylor Greene who in this backwards United States ends up on that very committee. Who does she think are the threats? People like Hunter Biden, people who she claims are socialists and communists, even though they are not. You know the drill. Rolling Stone reporting the new GOP controlled House is letting liars and conspiracy theorists lead its agenda. That is exactly right. Kevin McCarthy, the new Speaker of the House, indicated he will allow Congressman George Santos, currently facing multiple investigations for lying to voters about his identity, to also have a committee position. We're going to get to that later on in the program. Rolling Stone reminds us Green was removed from the House Education and Labor Committee and the Budget Committee in February of 21 over backlash from statements she made before her election, including that a bullet to the head was the quickest way to remove Nancy Pelosi from her then speakership. Green was also revealed to harbor a belief in QAnon, having spread conspiracy theories about mass shootings and suggested 9-11 was a hoax. Green will now serve on the Homeland Security Committee. I think it's great. Kevin McCarthy reportedly said on Tuesday some of Green's priorities. She recently said to Tucker Carlson she believes that current Department of Homeland Security Secretary Majorcus should be impeached. Uh, Paul Gozar is also on the uh, Committee for Natural Resources. He was censured by the House and ousted after he tweeted that um, anime battle sequence where um, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez was killed. Kevin McCarthy sure had to cut some pretty damn wild deals to get those votes and become Speaker of the House. That is abundantly clear. This is the United States of America in 2023. You support a failed coup. You defend the rioters. You say if you had been in charge of the coup, you would have won the coup. You get to stay in Congress, by the way. And then you get a job on the committee in charge of Homeland Security. This is where we are. And what of her experience even ostensibly qualifies for her for this role? Is it the harassment she engaged in of the victims of school shootings? Does that qualify her to be on the Homeland Security Committee? Is it any of the long list of things we've talked about before? It is embarrassing that this is where the country is. And you know how it'll go. Two years from now, we'll look back and we'll say, what are Marjorie Taylor Greene's accomplishments on this committee? And there will be none, nothing positive anyway. And then they will say, well, we couldn't get anything done because of Democrats in the Senate or whatever, but definitely vote for me again because now I'm part of the in group. And that's really what this is about for Marjorie Taylor Greene. And also that's a lot of the of the uh, catalyst for this new war she's engaged in with fellow lunatic Congresswoman Lauren Boebert. And that's what I want to talk about next. Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert, two dangerously delusional members of Congress, got into a verbal fight in the women's bathroom when dimwitted dunce clashes with brainless buffoon. This is what you get. Uh, it is being reported by uh, the Daily Beast and summarized by LGBTQ Nation. Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert allegedly got into a screaming match in the women's restroom. 
Um, both Green and Bobert have said trans women are a threat to cis women in public restrooms and locker rooms. But it appears the real aggression in the women's room, writes this article, is coming from them. The two far right anti LGBTQ plus extremists reportedly got into a shouting fight January 3rd, just as Congress was getting ready to vote for Speaker of the House, according to several unnamed sources who spoke to the Daily Beast. During the 15 votes that lasted for an entire week, you might remember that Boebert and some others were trying to prevent Kevin McCarthy from being speaker. Green is a member of that same wing, sometimes known as the Freedom Caucus, but she ended up siding with McCarthy, as we now know. The article goes on to say, according to one source, Green was exiting a stall when she conf confronted Bobert about the latter's plan to thwart McCarthy's election. Green allegedly accused Boebert of taking money from McCarthy for her campaign, but not showing loyalty. Now, she allegedly asked, you were OK taking millions of dollars from McCarthy, but you refused to vote for him for speaker. Lauren Green questioned Boebert's loyalty to McCarthy. And after words were exchanged, Boebert stormed out. That's when Lauren said, don't be ugly before Boebert, quote, ran out like a little schoolgirl. When questioned about the altercation, Boebert said, see you later. Bye. <laughs> Green hasn't commented either. Uh, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, Dingell Dingle was reportedly in the restroom when this happened, but she's not talking about it. What happens in the ladies room stays in the ladies room. This is um, this is part of this splintering of the Republican Party. I know I've said it before. I, uh, you know, apologies for those who have heard this, but you originally had Republicans pro and anti Trump, people like, you know, Mitt Romney in the anti Trump camp. You now still have the anti Trump Republicans, but you have MAGA or buffoonery, call it whatever you want, call it peaches for all I care, to quote Trump. Um, you now have MAGA subdividing and splintering. And of course, the dream scenario would be that they splintered themselves into oblivion. Whether it's going to happen or not, we just don't yet know. But um, Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene ending up on opposite sides of anything is certainly a sign that that splintering is taking place. The important thing for the left is, you know, I have never pushed for this false unity of the left. There's room for diverse views on the left, and there are also things that just aren't actually left. And so we shouldn't pretend that they are. It's not about false unity. But right now, the left actually is quite united. These voices that I've always said are relatively small in terms of power. They're very loud, but they're relatively small um, that do the purity tests and the litmus tests. They are not getting nearly the attention that they once did. And overall, the left is pretty damn united right now. I think that it's critical at a time when the right is splintering and sub splintering and sub splintering ad infinitum, hopefully. Um, that the left uh, uh, maintain focused on the big issues that we are trying to deal with. That includes getting people health care, dealing with inequality, um, uh, uh, health, uh, pl climate. There's so many. I don't even know in what order to go. The education crisis, the foreign policy embarrassments that plagued us under Trump on and on and on. The left has an opportunity to, in contrast to what's happening on the right, look quite organized and sane and united and allow the right to continue destroying itself. Meanwhile, Republicans continue to just do self-inflicted damage. And I want to talk about the, the new anti-museum, anti-book positions that are surfacing on the right. Oh, man, where to even start with this? Um, <laughs> Candace Owens has proudly and defiantly come out against museums, against museums. We have long spoken about the anti intellectual and pseudo intellectual leanings of the American right wing. They used to sort of couch them in a more, uh, what's the word? I don't want to say more defensible, but compared to now, a slightly more defensible way. But now it is just completely overt. These are really pathetic people, and they are playing to the lowest common denominator. A huge swath of the American right wing doesn't read, doesn't think critically, has no media literacy skills, and they just want their beliefs spoon fed to them by Fox News and people like Candace Owens and Ben Shapiro and others. And in order to keep them in that state, 
right wing influencers like Candace Owens have started to make them feel proud and confident in their beliefs that books are bad, learning is bad, museums are bad. And here is a segment of Candace Owens talking about how she's actually very anti museum. Take a look at this. Next question. What are your thoughts on the British Museum and their artifacts from other cultures? Yeah. They have returned many of them to Nigeria. Do you think they should return them all, Jensen? You know, I actually kind of hate a lot of museums because they steal our tax dollars. And so, yeah, defund all the museums and send back all the artifacts. The amount of money that was given in the covid bill, the trillions of dollars, all of it going to like the Kennedy Center, the African-American <laughs> Museum. And what do they do? People that sit on the board, take all the money. It's kind of become this huge money laundering operation. And yeah, I say return it all. If you want to see something, it's go to the country. You know, so I'm actually totally fine with that because only because I'm very anti museum because they stole a lot of our money. Yeah. Interestingly, she pronounces museum museum, which was but the only two people I know that do that are former producer Lewis and Candace Owens. We, years ago, we were wondering where did Lewis get this museum pronunciation? Maybe, maybe he and Candace Owens uh, went to that same ritzy school in Connecticut, right? No, in all seriousness, uh, this is the type of thing that many right wing and Republican voters consider fresh and interesting and sort of uh, uh, on the vanguard of thinking uh, the modern Republicans love this stuff. And her idea is go to the country, right? I mean, if you want to see historical artifacts like Egyptian mummies and Roman statues and Greek pottery, just go to the countries. It's just lying around there. You can just see it. Or if you want to see, um, you know, artwork from famous artists, whether it's the Mona Lisa or, you know, Star Van Gogh's Starry Night or whatever, go to the countries, whatever that means. If you want to see important documents like the Magna Carta or the Gutenberg Bible or whatever, go to the country, whatever the hell that means. This is part of a bigger movement that includes clips like this. This is Andrew Tate explaining why he is above reading books. He's above it. He's too good or too smart or too strong or whatever. Reading books is a very cheap way to, I guess, entertain. I wouldn't call it entertainment because my brain is far too advanced. I'm too smart to read. Right. I'm here to sit there and go, smart people read. No, I need action. I need constant chaos in my life <laughs> to feel content. I need to be driving a supercar and f***ing fighting, f***ing a bunch of hoes and champagne and going crazy. Right. I can't just sit there. Oh, why would you read a book when you can have champagne going crazy, just exploding, explosive champagne all over the place? You're not going to be bothered with a book. And the pirate on the boat, like, just for, for people with slow brains. Right. So this is now. Now, by, by the way, I, do I don't do I even really need to mention, by the way, it actually takes more brain power and uh, it's so fraught to use the term intelligence. It requires lots of brain power to actually go and get the information out of a book rather than sitting there with explosive champagne watching reality TV. Now, I have no problem with TV or any of it, right? I watch TV. I watch shows Kaleidoscope on Netflix right now, by the way, really good. You know, but the idea of books are for the lesser thinker sort of thing is part of the same. I'm against museums or museums or whatever pronunciation you choose. And this is all either with Candace Owens. I believe it's deliberate with Andrew Tate. I think it's not. I think he's just kind of stumbling across nonsense. Part of it is make the people that follow you feel good about just getting all of their beliefs from you without thinking about them too much without reading, without learning, without looking at alternative sources. They benefit from people thinking books. No, not for me, folks. We are in a crisis on YouTube. Something is happening on YouTube where our channel and others like ours appear to be getting deprioritized by some kind of algorithm. I will have more information about this when I have it. Please remember, like the video, leave a comment, hit the subscribe button. It's really the it's free and everybody can do it. And it will help us at youtube.com slash the David Pakman show.
Don't forget that the best way to support the David Pakman show is by becoming a member, which gives you access to the daily bonus show, the regular show with no commercials. You also get access to our entire archive of every episode dating back a really long time and plenty of other awesome membership perks. Go to joinpacman.com and use the coupon code better 21 for a huge discount. Joinpacman.com. Lying Republican Congressman George Santos would use a fake Jewish sounding name to raise money from Jews. Folks, I, I, I can't. I can't. It's there is no depth too low for this guy. This is just unbelievable. CNN's Anderson Cooper interviewed Gregory Maury Parker. This is a former friend and roommate of George Santos. And in speaking to Anderson Cooper, Maury, um, uh, <laughs> Maury Parker explains that when George Santos would run GoFundMe's, which is another scam, which we will get to, if he needed to entice Jewish donors, he would use a Jewish last name. Listen to this. How long did you actually live together? We were only uh, roommates for a few months, and I also knew him as uh, Anthony Zabrowski. So you knew him. He, he, why did he say he had two names then? Well, he he used Zabrowski for his uh, friends of Pets United, his um, uh, his GoFundMe, and he would say, "Oh well." You know, the, the Jews will give more if you're a Jew. And so that's the name he used for his GoFundMe's. And what was he having GoFundMe's for back then? Mm. Uh, his, he had a uh, pet charity, Friends of Pets United. Uh, it was supposedly to um, help out with, you know, sick animals and things like that. There's actually um, just an article released from um, uh, one of my reporters. Uh, who's been interviewing me a lot, uh, Jacqueline Sweet, about how he conned a, a homeless military vet out of $3,000 for his uh, service dog. OK, we're going to get back to that second part. But using the last name Zabrowski, 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 I don't know which version, in order to entice Jewish donors to donate. Now, there is a ton of Jewish related stuff going on with uh, George Santos, where he claimed to be Jewish in terms of his family history. Another example is he got into a discussion on a podcast called Loud Majority about whether Jewish people learn Spanish or not. Take a listen to this. I actually think we should do the whole the rest of this in Spanish. Let's I see. Think so let's see how your public education took up. You went to private school, right? I took yeah, Italian. I didn't do no. I didn't do no. Oh, I took I Spanish took in college. There you go. But I, you know what I did? You're, Jewish. You're supposed to learn Spanish. Jewish people don't learn Spanish. Yes, they do. No, they don't. Because that's how they become more cultured. At least that's By how learning I learned Spanish. It. Yeah, that's how I learned oh. it. <laughs> right. And then, now this is when he was still lying about being Jewish. You'll notice it's lies on top of lies on top of lies. Now, beyond parody, this guy, the, the George Santos that we now know lied about everything. And soon you will see bilked a disabled veteran out of money for his dog and the dog died. OK, he has been assigned to the House Small Business Committee and the Science Space and Technology Committee. Here is a report from yesterday from MSNBC. George Santos is going to serve on two committees in the House of Representatives on behalf of the Republican Conference. They will be the Small Business Committee and the Space Science and Technology Committees. <laughs> uh, and I actually just caught up with the House Speaker Kevin McCarthy a few minutes ago as he was leaving the Capitol. He confirmed to me our reports uh, about the Santos committee assignments. And yeah, so he's going to be on committees. This guy who has lied about everything, scammed people, stolen money, lied about inventing carbon capture technology, lied about being Jewish, lied about everything. He gets committee assignments. And one other funny note from this interview with Santos's former roommate with Anderson Cooper, I guess that the, <laughs> Santos stole a scarf from his friend and then wore it to the stop the steal rally or whatever. And I understand he was actually wearing something he took from you at a pre January 6 rally in Washington. If is that yes, a scarf? You can believe this. He has the audacity. Yes. Wait a minute. That is the, He's wearing the scarf, a stolen scarf to a stole steal the election rally. <laughs> you, you have to love the irony oh and the audacity, quite frankly. So a complete and total liar. 
and this isn't even the half of it. Listen to this next story. George Santos stole a disabled veterans dogs charity money and the dog died. Let that sink in, folks. Um, Report from patch dot com disabled veteran George Santos took three thousand dollars from dying dogs. Go fund me. This one is even worse than it sounds, if you can believe it. Two New Jersey veterans veterans say George Santos promised to raise funds for a life saving surgery for a service dog and then disappeared. Report out of Queens in May 2016, Richard Osthoff was living in a tent in an abandoned chicken coop on the side of Route 9 in Howell, New Jersey, with his beloved service dog Sapphire, a veterans charity gave the pit mix to Osthoff, who's a disabled veteran honorably discharged from the Navy. Sapphire, the dog, developed a life threatening stomach tumor. Osthoff learned the surgery would cost three thousand dollars. A vet tech said to Osthoff, I know a guy who runs a pet charity who can help you. That guy was Anthony DeVolder. Now, at this point, you might know Anthony DeVolder is the name George Santos used to use. So we're talking about George Santos. The pet charity was called Friends of Pets United. OK, Osthoff and another New Jersey vet, retired police sergeant Michael Bull, tried to intervene to help Osthoff in 2016, told Patch, hey, you know what? DeVolder, we'll call him Santos. That's how we know him. Santos uh, closed the GoFundMe he set up for Sapphire after it raised three thousand dollars on social media, but then disappeared. Osthoff said he stopped answering my texts and calls. He posted to Facebook in 2016 to everyone who helped me and Sapphire raise the money for her surgery. I'm sorry to say we were scammed by Anthony DeVolder through a series of bad veterinary contacts and subterfuge regarding payment. Sapphire has not received vet care. Her growth is three to four times bigger than it was when the campaign was fulfilled. She is facing euthanasia within months. Sapphire indeed died January 15th of 2017. After being out of work with a broken leg for over a year, Osthoff couldn't even afford the dog's euthanasia and cremation. He had to panhandle for it, which he called one of the most degrading things he ever had to do. I contacted Santos and told him you're messing with a vet. Give the money back or use it to get Osthoff another dog. He was totally uncooperative on the phone, said Bull. I can see why this guy loves Trump. I can see why this guy loves Trump. This is way worse than the headline even makes it sound. And this is the guy, George Santos, Anthony DeVolder, who has now been assigned to multiple committees, the House of Representatives. And apparently, I don't know, but apparently is going to be able to weather the media storm and stick around for two years, despite being one of the most disgusting individuals I've learned about in all of my time covering American and world politics. Um, I am losing faith that he is going to be removed. I uh, he's just he's just sticking around. And particularly now with committee assignments, it doesn't seem like Republicans and Kevin McCarthy have any interest in forcing him out for all we know. And as the speculation uh, uh, is is growing, McCarthy and Santos struck a deal. Santos supports McCarthy for speaker. McCarthy doesn't try to push him out. And of course, the support of the speaker is a very powerful thing for a member of Congress, particularly a new one. Where will this end? What will we next learn about George Santos, Anthony DeVolder? Let me know in the comments. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube. And of course, all of the clips I played for you in this segment and earlier segments are available on our YouTube channel as well as on our Instagram. If you value what we do at The David Pakman Show, remember to support us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash David Pakman Show, where you can get access to behind the scenes videos, the daily bonus show, the commercial free daily show, as well as special discounts on merch, including hats, hoodies, mugs and T-shirts. 
You can support the show for as little as two dollars a month. Check it out at patreon.com slash David Pakman show. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Mary Claire O'Brien, who's a professor of emergency medicine at Wake Forest University School of Medicine, who was the leading medical expert informing the FDA decision to remove pre-mixed alcoholic energy drinks from U.S. markets back in 2010. It's really great to have you on today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me. So maybe to start with energy drinks in general, when we talk about what they are, I think most people understand it's a stimulant of sorts. Some of them have caffeine, which we're used to getting when we drink coffee. What exactly is it always caffeine or are there other stimulant stimulant elements in these energy drinks? And how does the dosage compare to a cup of coffee, for example? So those are all very good questions. So uh, from a physiologic standpoint, energy is calories that you consume. But all of us would understand that really what energy drinks do is deliver caffeine in one or various forms, either added as a chemical or uh, in guarana or yerba mate or other things where there are additives that are essentially just other forms of caffeine. Brewed black coffee has about uh, 34. The average homebrew black coffee has about 100 milligrams of caffeine in it. And that's a good strong cup of homebrewed black coffee. And a cola that you would buy over the counter has about uh, 35 or 50 milligrams of caffeine in it. Energy drinks are very variable in the amount of caffeine that they contain because of a quirk of an FDA situation in which they are not regulated as beverage by the Food and Drug Administration. So you can't pick up a cola on a shelf, a 12 ounce cola that has more than 70 parts. 70 milligrams of caffeine in it, which is 200 parts per million. But an energy drink, oddly enough, is considered a dietary supplement by the FDA, and they are not regulated. An energy drink may contain anywhere from, you know, 100 to 150 to 200 milligrams of caffeine. Those little bitty energy shots that people pick up all the time have 200 milligrams of caffeine. Wow. So in two ounces, cold, one chug, you're drinking the equivalent of two very strong cups of hot black coffee that you would otherwise take your time to sip and you get that jolt of caffeine right away. Uh, when we talk about the feeling of I have coffee and I feel awake and energized, sometimes there's the belief that you are getting something. But in it, but what's happening really is that the caffeine is blocking the sleep pressure that builds up. If I recall correctly from Michael Pollan's book, it's the buildup of adenosine that over time makes well, us feel tired. So the caffeine is sort right of like money. it's delaying fe feeling tired, really. Right. That's what it does. Yes. So caffeine, although we call it a stimulant, is not a stimulant. What it does is it makes you feel less sleepy. Right. Now, for those of us who are sleepy, who want to be stimulated, the feeling of having caffeine and waking up, we all are pretty familiar with it. Most of us drink some caffeinated beverage in the morning. However, uh, it is in fact not stimulating you. It's blocking the chemical that's naturally released in your body that makes you feel sleepy. So, so caffeine makes you feel less sleepy. It does not stimulate you. Unless, of course, you talk about the way that it potentially could stimulate, let's say, your heart rate or your blood pressure when large quantities are consumed or when normal quantities are consumed or what would generally be regarded as safe in susceptible individuals, people who might be sensitive to the effects of the caffeine. So before we get on to the energy drink health stuff, how should we be thinking about what you just described? Is it different than how something like Adderall or amphetamines yes. work? 100 percent. Yes. Mm hmm. Caffeine basically makes you a little, it makes you less sleepy. Uh, it is not an addictive substance in the way that we would think about perhaps methamphetamine. And I'm not sure that for the average person, the difference between being less sleepy, sleepy and being mildly stimulated makes a whole lot of practical difference. Okay. It, it does, however, have uh, important implications when we start talking about mixing energy drinks with alcohol. Uh, and the idea that if you take an energy drink uh, or high, consume large amounts of caffeine with alcohol, that it will stimulate you. And the fact that you feel a little bit less sleepy means that the other neuropsychiatric effects of alcohol and motor effects of alcohol are likewise reduced when they are not. 
OK, so before we introduce the alcohol part, what are the risks of just extremely high doses of caffeine? You know, I, I remember a story of someone who um, owned a coffee shop and for their cold brew, they used a concentrate. And mm -hmm. one day somebody forgot that it's supposed to be watered down. And all of a sudden the caffeine dose in a cup is 10 X what it's supposed to be, mm -hmm. whether it's a ca caffeine in coffee or an energy drink. What are the risks of too much caffeine too quickly? So the answer to that question uh, has to be preceded by it depends on whom are the effects. OK, so in healthy individuals who are not otherwise susceptible, the FDA says we shouldn't consume more than 400 milligrams of caffeine. So let's say four cups of coffee. Less than that is generally regarded as safe unless you have a pre-existing condition, which you might not know about. But anyway, that's what's generally for a healthy, non-pregnant, non-nursing adult. That's considered safe. Over what period of time? In one day. In, in a day. A OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For pregnant or nursing uh, individuals, that number is 200 milligrams, so yep. no more than two cups of coffee. And it's not saying that that is a good idea, but it's saying we think that's generally regarded as safe. In adolescents, it's 100 milligrams, so that's a strong cup of coffee. But most of us aren't going to give our 12-year-olds a strong cup of coffee in the morning before they go to school. But that's the number or the limit that's sort of been set by the FDA. And then for uh, children, there is absolutely no safe level whatsoever, zero. American Academy of Pediatrics, even though uh, they state that 30 to 50 percent of adolescents drink energy drinks. There is absolutely no level of safety established in children. Adolescents should not drink energy drinks. Children should not drink energy drinks. Hard stop. And when we talk about the negative health consequences that having more than that 400 uh, milligrams can have, what are they? So I think uh, most of us who've had a little bit too much caffeine or had it too late at night have experienced jitteriness, insomnia, nervousness, sometimes at higher doses ringing in the ears. Uh, it can cause stomach upset, nausea. Uh, there are uh, it can cause flushing. It's also uh, curiously thought uh, chronic levels of caffeine ingestion are thought to decrease calcium absorption. Hmm. So one of the things you worry about is over time, adolescents, women drinking uh, high levels of caffeine or steady levels of caffeine will that uh, predispose to osteoporosis. So it definitely interferes with calcium metabolism. And then in pregnant individuals, a uh, high and or heavy use of caffeine habitually has been associated with increased risk for miscarriage and for having babies that are small for gestational age at birth. Now that's all, you know, most of us have been familiar uh, with some of the side effects that we would get. But remember in susceptible individuals, there are people who can't even drink a single cup of coffee. And how do you know that? You don't know till you get you know, supraventricular tachycardia. And now, guess what? You can only have decaf. Right. Uh, which is not no calf, but, you know, much less calf. So when we introduce the alcohol component, and this could be an energy drink that is already alcohol plus the caffeine in the package, it can also be the infamous uh, Red Bull and vodka, right? I mean, these are also drinks that mm -hmm. one can kind of mix on their own. What happens when you combine the two? So the premixed uh, alcoholic energy drinks, which is the terminology that was used, premixed alcoholic energy drinks, and I won't mention the brands because I don't want to give them airtime, but they're they are 100% off the market in the United States. Right. And that and that is because uh, it is uh, very clear that um, increasing that mixing caffeine in alcohol, those prepackaged things, which was never permitted by the FDA, was never permitted. It's just the industry got away with it until the FDA called them. Um, that, uh, that it is associated with increased amount of drinking, heavy drinking, binge episodes. So heavier drinking, more frequent heavy drinking, and an increased risk of serious alcohol related consequences like driving with an intoxicated driver, being sexually assaulted, assaulting someone else sexually, and being hurt or injured enough to need to seek medical attention. And what we believe is that the alcohol, or pardon me, that the caffeine masks some of the cues that you might get that you had had too much to drink, mm. that the caffeine masks that for the alcohol. So you're still drunk if you've drunk enough alcohol to get to be drunk, but you perceive because of the caffeine that you're not as drunk as you think you are. And uh, what you are is uh, been well described as a wide awake drunk. And that's a dangerous thing because you think you're OK and you are not. So uh, when we read about are. people who go to the ER after combining these types of elements and from what I've read, one in 10 of those ER visits leads to a hospitalization. What is it people are showing up with? What what is it that leads to them ending up at the ER? 
So what happens is they go to a drinking situation where they intend to party. Sometimes they uh, preload with a caffeinated beverage. Sometimes they consume the caffeine while they're consuming the alcohol. Two things happen. One is that the caffeine starts to wear off before the alcohol does because alcohol is metabolized at a steady state. It doesn't matter how much you drink. If you have five beers or 10 beers, you're gonna chip away or your liver will uh, at, at how much alcohol there is. It, independent of how much you drunk, you only can metabolize a certain amount uh. every hour. Those of us who drink caffeine are aware that if you have two cups of coffee at eight o'clock, by one o'clock in the afternoon, you're ready for another cup of coffee. And this is because of the half-life processing correct. of the caffeine versus linear yep. with alcohol. That is 100% correct. So there's two things that happen. One is that the that the caffeine uh, starts to wear off before the alcohol wears off. Mm -hmm. The second thing, what that permits you to do is to stay awake longer. So if you drink 10 beers, you're going to pass out. But if you've high loaded on a lot of caffeine, the same amount of alcohol might not make you pass out. You keep drinking longer. Mm. So when the caffeine wears off, folks come into the emergency department, basically comatose because they've drunk far more alcohol than they would otherwise have been able to tolerate without passing out because they have had the effect of the caffeine keeping them, helping them to stay awake longer. Wow. Yeah. You know, anecdotally, I, I've had experience with this, not in the situation you're describing. But since I was a kid, I, I would have a sort of like vasovagal episodes where I would faint. And mm -hmm. as an adult, I had a situation where before boarding a flight in Rome, I had an espresso with my girlfriend in the waiting area because it's Rome. Right. I mean, what do people right. do? And then on the plane, they served free wine. I never sure. have alcohol on airplanes, but I said I get it's a long flight. We're watching a movie. I'll have it was right. one espresso and one glass of wine. I was very dehydrated and I fainted on sure. a plane and it became a horrible thing. I needed, mm. you know, 30 days of a heart monitor to make sure I was OK. It was just one right. of these episodes. But that seems to be another. And, and that's also that same combination of how these things operate. Right. It is. And, and what that would tell you that you as an individual are susceptible. Right. And so even though the FDA would say, oh, you could have up to four strong cups of coffee every day, you know better because you've had the experience of mixing one espresso with one glass of alcohol and your body does not tolerate it. Right. How do you know whether or not you're one of the susceptible individuals? You have to have something bad happen. Yeah, first. I figured so it out. Right. Yeah. What right. are the um, for people who regularly consume either significant amounts of energy drinks with or without the, the alcohol combination? But in either case, what do we know about long term health effects? So that's a very, very good question. And one of the things that is challenging in the research is that uh, human studies on caffeine, high levels of caffeine over long periods of time are really limited by two things. The first is tremendous variation in individual sensitivity to caffeine and then in the way it, the amount in which caffeine, the rate at which caffeine is metabolized. So you metabolize caffeine a little bit differently than I do. And that's because we're all individuals, because I'm a woman, you're a man. You may or may not smoke cigarettes. You may or may not be taking medications that would affect your caffeine metabolism. And so individuals, even if you had 10 individuals sign up for a lab trial, going into it, that confounds the study. And secondly, we, we worry long term about the cardiovascular uh, side effects in particular, and again, about bone density. Uh, and and the ability to do the research that would establish it is ethically constrained yes. for that reason, particularly so for women when they're concerned about re where, where there are concerns about reproductive effects of right. long term use of caffeine. When we talk about studies that make claims and this is more general, I think, about coffee than it is about energy drinks per se. But I'm curious your thoughts. Uh, you know, drinking two to three cups of coffee a day is associated with longer lifespan, right? This is a common thing. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like with eggs, coffee is good and then it's bad and then it's good. And it depends how you test it or yeah. who you ask or when, what, you know, with, with anything food and drink related, it seems that part of the difficulty is whenever you're adding or taking something away, you're always replacing with something else. And it can be hard to know whether the effect is from the removal of some or uh -huh. What yeah. is the best science we currently have about those types of claims, about a couple of cups of coffee and longevity? So uh, what we do know is that healthy, non-pregnant, non-nursing individuals can uh, include an energy drink or a strong cup of coffee or two in their daily diet with um, uh, in moderation. So just like you would do anything else in moderation for healthy, non-pregnant, non-nursing individuals, uh, caffeine in moderation is thought to be generally regarded as safe. And that's what we know. Now, that's extraordinarily narrow language. It is generally regarded 
This, yeah, uh, th th you know, when when my girlfriend, uh, when we were in the process of starting a pregnancy, um, she was told by by a doctor that some of the assistive medications that exist, we don't currently believe they increase the risk of reproductive cancers, which again, when I hear that, I say it sounds Forget like it. they might. It sounds right. like they might. Yeah. The, the, and so we really don't know. Uh, we know that it's generally regarded as safe. OK, that's what we know, uh, with the exceptions that, uh, for pregnancy, for nursing, uh, for adolescents and for individuals who might be susceptible, whoever they are. Yeah. That's OK, what we know. Wow. Well, which, which I guess I guess the answer is we maybe would like to know more than we actually do know right now. It's true. Remember that the there are constraints around science that would establish what's safe. Part of it is the individual metabolism absorption of these substances and then Part of it is uh, constraints over long term health effects that are unknown and, and, and that limit our ability to reproduce in the laboratory what people commonly do in real life. Right. Um, last thing I wanted to ask you about, do you think that so obviously with the premix drinks, they're off the shelf. It's a regulatory decision that that was made when it comes to I mean, you tell me coffee of different kinds or energy drinks that are just energy drinks. Do you think there needs to be more regulation or government involvement or is it really just about educating people and, and making people aware of the amounts of these things that they're consuming? So you asked my opinion, so I'm going to give you an opinion. Yes. And I and I think it's poppycock that they are regulated as dietary supplements. Ah. They're be beverages. And that was a decision made in the mid 1990s. The decision that the FDA made about limiting the caffeine in cola beverages was made in 1959. And the energy drinks really came onto the market in the 1990s, uh, particularly late 1980s, early 1990s. And in the mid 1990s, the FDA made a decision that said these are uh, dietary supplements. They're, they're not beverages. And if they were regulated in the same way as are the can of Coca-Cola that you can buy in the grocery store right next to them, then that would make more sense to me. I think it's poppycock. And uh, if they and, were regulated in the same way as soda, the differences would be labeling or also there would be limits that would be placed. Yeah, there would be limits. So we mentioned guarana and yerba mate. Those are both natural sources of caffeine. And so they are listed as additives to energy drinks. They're more caffeine. Mm. Now, I did a little research uh, to prepare for speaking with you and looked at a couple of things on the shelf. And most of them, most of the beverages that I saw do list the amount of caffeine that's in them. OK. However, there is not. Um, I just think we would not you would not uh, give, you know, three or four cups of coffee to your average 13 year old. You would not let a kid in high school think that an energy drink could serve as a sports drink when they're not. You, you would. You, and yet that's what goes on. Yeah. Wow. Well. We will see if that ever is there well, an appetite to change that, do you think? It doesn't seem like yes. it or there is. Oh, OK, no, there is. And, and and letters have been written by a couple of senators. And these this goes back a while, though. Yeah. Is there a current appetite? No. Was there a lot of appetite in the wake of the research about the health effects of of energy drinks and alcohol? Yes. Mm. Did that did that stir the pot about the health effects of energy drinks at all without alcohol? Yes. Has that uh, uh, energy and enthusiasm for making change continued. It has not over the last decade, and I'm not sure why that is. Understood. Um, Understood. We've been speaking with Dr. Mary Claire O'Brien, professor of emergency medicine at Wake Forest University School of Medicine. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate your insights. You're welcome. I am impressed with your level of knowledge about the science of the subject, and you can call me anytime. That Thank you. Follow us on social media, interact with the David Pakman Show community, see exclusive content, see when we're taking calls live and stay up to date on other big show announcements. We post daily. Find us on Reddit, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord and TikTok. We are now talking about Trump perjury, Trump reportedly lying many times during a completely unhinged deposition which we have some of the trans transcripts of and the full transcript is yet to be released, but apparently will be Newsweek reporting. Donald Trump may have severely damaged his case in the defamation lawsuit brought against him by a woman who accused him of rape 
by expressing, quote, repeated lies during his deposition, according to an attorney. Katie Fang, who's a legal analyst and MSNBC host, was reacting to the unsealed transcripts of testimony Trump gave. This is the E. Jean Carroll lawsuit. Carroll accused Trump of raping her in the mid 90s. Trump denies it. Carol is now suing Trump for defaming her character, including stating in a 2019 interview he wouldn't have raped her because she is not his type, which is an absolutely insane thing to say. Trump later repeated the same remark on Troth Central in October of 2022, Troth Central, right before the deposition took place. During his testimony, which was unsealed Monday, Trump defended his not my type remarks while calling the rape claim a hoax and calling the accuser a whack job and a liar. Um, Fang said the legal significance is Trump steps in it over and over again. And more importantly, he basically denies flat out he's ever touched a woman and any part of her body specifically is denying touching a woman on the breast or buttocks or any other sexual part without her consent. He said no under oath. The whole world knows that on an Access Hollywood tape, he boasted about how he would grab them by the blank and you can do it when you're a star. He's caught in repeated lies throughout the course of his sworn videotaped uh, deposition. There is now a bunch of the transcript and it is wacky. You can just imagine Trump talking about this. He was asked, you say she, she completely made up a story that I met her at the doors of this crowded New York City department store and within minutes swooned her. Do you see that? Trump says, yeah. What does swooned her mean? Trump, that would be a word, maybe accurate or not, having to do with talking to her and talking to her to do an act that she said happened, which didn't happen. And it's a nicer word than the word that starts with an F. <laughs> and this would be a word that I used because I thought it would be inappropriate to use the other word. And it didn't happen. Anybody know what he's talking about? The question that follows. OK, I was curious when I read this. So I looked up the word swoon in the dictionary and under the dictionary, it means to faint with extreme emotion. That's not what you meant here. Trump says, well, sort of that's what she said I did to her. She fainted with great emotion. She actually indicated that she loved. OK, she loved it until commercial break. In fact, I think she said it was sexy, didn't she? She said it was very sexy to be raped. Didn't she say that? So, sir, I just want to confirm it's your testimony that E. Jean Carroll said she loved being sexually assaulted by you. <laughs> Trump says, well, based on her interview with Anderson Cooper, I believe that's what took place. And we can define that. You'll have to show that. I'm sure you're going to show that. But she was interviewed by Anderson Cooper, and I think she said rape was sexy, which it's not, by the way, Trump clarifies. Um, I hope we at some point get video of this deposition because it is absolutely and completely insane. But importantly, lying during a deposition can have very serious legal consequences, including perjury charges. Perjury is a criminal offense. It can result in imprisonment. It can result in fines. But of course, remember, proving perjury is very difficult. This is why I mean, listen, you and I know People lie all the time under oath in court. They say things that aren't true. And many of them know that the things they're saying are untrue. But why don't you often see perjury charges? Because in order to get a perjury charge to stick, you have to demonstrate that the person knew what they were saying was untrue rather than it was the result of a mistaken recollection or a lack of recollection or whatever the case may be. Very, very difficult. Uh, the other issue with lying during a deposition is that you can be held in contempt. This is all so unlikely to happen to Trump. But it is, again, more of Trump's dishonesty, more of Trump's inability to just shut his mouth and um, answer very directly only what is being asked. And lawyers are now saying many, many lies here. And it is perjury. What is ultimately going to happen with the E. Jean Carroll lawsuit? We don't know. Understand that we now have the federal investigation into Trump, the New York investigation into Trump, the Georgia investigation into Trump, wherein a grand jury recently finished its work and we're waiting, could be any day. We find out whether Trump is going to be charged there. Uh, we have this lawsuit. We have the cases against Trump's organization. I'm sure I'm not even covering all of it. And the next thing involves Rudy Giuliani, including Rudy's claim that Trump told him, hey, Rudy, take some of these top, top secret files to your house. Let's talk, talk about that next. Rudy Giuliani humiliated lawyer 
Rudy Giuliani, who once represented failed former President Donald Trump, is now saying very clearly and very directly, Trump would tell me, take uh, top secret files home with you. Take them home with you, Rudy. We don't even know if Rudy had a clearance to look at those files. Never mind. He obviously should not be taking them home. Business Insider reports Rudy Giuliani says Trump once told him to take top secret documents home. Giuliani said the incident occurred just after Trump became president when he was working at Mar-a-Lago. Giuliani said he did not bring the documents home. Giuliani says he was at Mar-a-Lago working on, quote, vetting some, quote, very rich people, specifically going through their tax returns for Trump. This happened right after Trump became president. Quote, when I was his lawyer, I mean, there was a period of time I was there like uh, 10 straight days. Giuliani said on the Sunday episode of the W.A.B.C. 77 radio show, uncovering the truth with Rudy Giuliani and Dr. Maria Ryan. I didn't take listen to this. This is my training on top secret. I didn't take him out of Mar-a-Lago describing how he handled the documents. He told me, oh, take him home with you, Giuliani said of Trump. I'm not going to take Wilbur Ross's tax returns home with me. I could misplace them. I you know, I never, ever, 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 ever knowingly and I never got caught. But I don't remember ever taking a document. Giuliani said he said he would put the documents in a small safe at his desk in Mar-a-Lago to be worked on the next day. Giuliani also said top secret files are, quote, very, very strange the way they're put together and often are very small, but they contain a lot of information. Giuliani and a spokesman for Trump did not immediately respond. Now, put aside just for a moment, take them home. There is a broader question. Did Rudy Giuliani have a security clearance throughout his time um, uh, working in this capacity to even look at those documents? And the answer is we don't know. Um, Back in 2019, McGuire says he doesn't know if Giuliani had a security clearance. Acting director of national intelligence Joseph McGuire said he doesn't know whether Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, has security clearance amid questions over his role in Trump's interactions with Ukraine's president. McGuire said, I don't know whether or not Giuliani has a security clearance. This came in response to questioning from Congressman Mike Quigley about whether it was improper for Giuliani to be involved in Trump asking Zelensky to investigate Biden and Hunter. Uh, Multiple reports about that. If you go back to that point in time on MSNBC, acting DNI doesn't know if Rudy Giuliani had a security clearance. Even if you have a clearance, It's not like you can just be waltzing in and out and looking through files. And I think this is one of the important details that should be added just sort of generally when we have these conversations about classified documents, security clearances, et cetera. Having the clearance is necessary to be able to look at a lot of different documents and files, but it is not sufficient. And what's important to understand, and a couple of lawyers wrote to me about this and explained it to me clearly. The the clearance is required to even be eligible to look at a lot of the stuff. But in addition, you have to have some connection to it. You have to have some need to know there has to be some reason, some nexus as to why you and the document are coming into contact. And with a lot of these issues, it seems as though there are some that believe if you have a particular clearance, you can just willy nilly on a whim at any point in time grab the files that are uh, um, in line with that security clearance with no actual operational or working connection to them. You can't at least not the way the, the, the rules and the law is written. Now, what was going on in Trump's White House? We know that with Jared Kushner and some others, they, they didn't even really they weren't supposed to get security clearances, but then there was like an override done and they got them anyway. We covered it years ago. We really don't know what the standard operating procedure was. But Trump telling Rudy just take documents home is very much in line with what we have seen and learned about over those many years. Are any of these people ever going to be held accountable? No, I mean, this is sort of like a footnote and, uh, you know, multiple criminal investigations into Trump, Rudy Giuliani disbarred in some places, all these things. This is so comparatively minor. Under Obama, it would have been absolutely and totally huge. Obama. They would it would be a week on Fox News. But with Rudy and Trump, it's just like a little footnote. It's not going anywhere, sadly.
We have a voicemail number. That number is two one nine two David P. We talked about the inflation numbers last week. We talked about food as a component of the total inflation numbers. We talked about, by the way, one person who wrote to me and said, David, inflation can't be down because eggs are expensive. I forgot to mention in that story the following, which a caller does mention, thankfully, about why eggs specifically are pricey right now. Hey, David, Carolyn from Minnesota. Yes, ma'am. Talking about the price of eggs. Did everybody forget we had the avian flu? Right. Thank you. Yes, this is one component to why egg prices have out uh, have not outperformed perform makes it sound good. This is why egg prices have remained and continued up even as inflation has declined. And this avian flu outbreak is absolutely a component to that. I mentioned this, you know, I get the I don't know how I got sucked into this. I basically I I don't eat so many eggs that a couple bucks one way or the other makes a difference. So I read you really want not grass fed or whatever. Grass fed is is BS. You want 100 percent pasture raised eggs. And so I fell for it. And by fell for it, I, I mean, it sounds pretty good to me. I can tell you the yolks are much more orange and you do like to see that it looks healthy. Anyway, these pasture raised eggs that I get, they used to be like five ninety nine a dozen, then six forty nine, then six ninety nine. Now they're up to seven forty nine. I'm still buying them. And again, I go through so few eggs that we're talking about a difference of like three dollars a month. But I have noticed that the eggs have remained high and indeed the avian flu outbreaks are a factor, which hopefully will not continue to be a factor too much longer. We have a fantastic bonus show for you today. It is really easy to get the bonus show. All you have to do is sign up at joinpacman.com. Oh, the bonus show where you want to make money. Yes. Everybody else that makes money to fund themselves is bad. As a member, you not only get access to the bonus show, you get a commercial free audio and video stream of the show every day. You also get launching very soon a soundboard like mine just for members. Thank your lucky stars every day. You're not Dave Pacman. If you want to prank your friends, if you want to do whatever it is people would do with my soundboard by popular demand, we are releasing the soundboard to our members very, very soon. And so you will be able to do things like truth, essential, a really great time. We're all very mature here on the show. OK, you sign up at joinpacman.com. What's on today's bonus show? The White House and Secret Service are saying no visitor logs for Biden's Delaware home. We don't have them. They don't exist. You're not getting them. Okay, this is related to the classified document investigation. The new monument in Boston dedicated to Martin Luther and Coretta Scott King has sparked serious debate and has widely triggered many on the right, but has also been mocked by people on the left as well. And lastly, the gas stove is the new battle line in American culture wars. I am going to make an extremely important declaration on the bonus show about my relationship to gas stoves present and future. I think many in the audience will be shocked by what I'm going to announce, but I'm going to announce it nonetheless. All of those stories and more on today's bonus show. Sign up at joinpacman.com. We'll see you then.